Thank you. So I'm Fred. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a theory for compiling dense and sparse linear algebra and tensor algebra. Uh, and we have implemented this theory in a compiler that we call TACO, which is abbreviated for tensor algebra compiler. So tensors are everywhere these days, from data analytics to machine learning to science and engineering. Uh, a tensor is a generalization of a matrix that has two dimensions to any number of dimensions, so fewer or more dimensions. So consider this Amazon tensor, which consists of people, products, and words that these people use in product reviews. This tensor is extremely sparse. As you can see, there's no way you can store this tensor as a dense tensor. So you have to compress it into sparse formats. That's where you need sparse tensor algebra. So uh, I'm going to uh, describe why you need a tensor algebra compiler to do these kind of things. So consider the alternative, which would be to write a library for this. This is what we've been doing for dense computations for a long time. Uh, I'm going to describe why we need to go towards a compiler technique for the sparse case. So um, consider writing this tensor algebra library. Uh, the first kernel you want to write is a simple matrix vector multiplication with a sparse matrix. So Eigen, the Eigen library implemented this kernel. The C-sparse library implemented this variant where you accumulate into a result. Uh, the OSCE library implemented this variant, and then Petsy implemented these three other variants. And the reason why people implemented all these different variants by hand is that you can get more performance by not just implementing the binary expressions, but by implementing whole compound kernels. But then you have to have different formats for the sparse matrix. These are some of the most common formats for a sparse matrix. These formats can be blocked, they can be variable size blocked, and it can be doubly compressed. And then the vector can be dense or sparse as well. So the number of variants you have to write grows a lot, and this is just sparse matrix vector multiplication. Then we add in, in the infinitely many other tensor algebra expressions, and now we have to go towards a compiler. Uh, and if you, don't, uh, if you don't implement a lot of these kernels as whole compound kernels, you lose a lot of performance. So in the rest of this talk, I'm first going to describe how sparse code and data works. Then I'm going to describe how our compiler automates this process of generating these kernels. And then I'm going to evaluate our technique. But first, let's get a feel for sparse code and sparse data. So this is a tensor vector multiplication expression. So, for e uh, so you multiply a ten tree tensor by a vector to get a matrix. So that means for each ij, you sum over all the k's. So if all of these, uh, the matrix, the tensor, and the vector are all dense, then you write this code. And this is simple dense code. We know how to write this code. You loop over all the i's, all the j's, all the k's, and you compute in the middle. But suppose you want to start making parts of this tensor sparse. So in our technique, you can choose for each dimension of a tensor whether that dimension is dense or that dimension is sparse. So I'm going to make the first dimension of these sparse. It became sparse now then that means I have to change this loop, the iterator or sparse data structure, so I change the loop. The next dimension, if I want to make that sparse, I have to change the loop that uh, is in that dimension. For the third dimension, if I want to make that dimension sparse, I do the same. But if I want to make this vector sparse as well, now I have to insert this code that, in, uh, that iterates over the intersection of the sparse tensor and the sparse vector. Uh, and it's an intersection because uh, multiplying by zero gives you a zero. And if I want to add the tensor to another tensor before I multiply by the vector, I have to write all this code. So I'm not expecting you to read this code, but I'm also not expecting you to write this code. So let's now, that's what sparse code. So let's get a feel for how the sparse formats work. So this is a matrix. Uh, this is a tensor, a tree tensor, laid out as matrix slices. So if I want to store this as a dense tensor, a dense storage format, I just lay it out continuously in memory. If I want to find any location in this tensor, I can just compute a strided formula and I get that location. So I have fast random access. And when you compute with this, you typically stream through the whole tensor, but uh, this random access shows that we have a lot of flexibility in how we do that. For uh, sparse data and compressed formats, the story is, very, is very different. So if I want to compress this tensor, I just remove the non-zeros. I remove the zeros, sorry. Uh, I compress the non-zeros right next to each other and the indices I have don't form a complete tree anymore, a full tree. So now I have to store them because I don't know where they are. So I store the i's, I store the j's, I store for each i which j's correspond to that i. 
Then I do the same process for the case. I store the case, I store which j's correspond to which case, and I get the corresponding values there. So traversing through this data structure is much more complicated than just computing a strided formula. If I want to look at i2, j0, k2, I have to sort of wiggle my way down this tensor. Consider the j's, then scan over the j's, then consider the case, then scan over the case, and then I get to the bottom. So the main thing I want you to take away is that there's a, this data structure imposes a dependency on my loop nests that are, the code we emit have to observe. And I can draw this uh, dependency symbolically by drawing a, a, a path through the i, j, and k index variable in expression, which will turn into loops. So in the next section of this talk, I'm going to describe how a compiler automates generating sparse and dense tensor algebra code. So first, I'm going to give you an overview. This is the tensor algebra compiler, or TACO. Uh, the compiler takes two things as input. It takes a tensor expression that can be arbitrarily large, any number of operands and operators. It also takes for each operand uh, a format describing whether that operand is dense or sparse in each dimension. Then it turns around and it spits out C code that computes the expression on the formats. Inside the compiler turns the expression into what we call an iteration graph, which is a new intermediate representation we have developed. The iteration graph is then used to generate code, and during code generation, we use another concept we have developed called a merge lattice. And I'll describe both of these concepts for you. So first, before you can understand uh, how uh, a technique works, you have to understand how sparsity impacts the iteration spaces of the loop that iterates over these tensor expressions. So consider this tensor vector multiplication again. If, I, if this is a dense expression with all dense operands, I have to iterate over i, j, k. And you can think of that as a three-dimensional space, an iteration space. And that space uh, forms a three-dimensional polyhedron. And at each point in the polyhedron, I access a different value from b. And then I have to access c as well. And since c is a one-dimensional access, but it gets accessed for each i, j, I can think of it as being replicated across the space. And when I want to actually do the computation, I merge these two things together and compute a product at every point in this iteration space. So that's a dense case. And we have been doing this for a long time. But applications have been moving towards sparse representations and sparse data structures. So let's consider what happens if we um, make these uh, data structures sparse. Now we can think of this iteration space as having holes. It's polyhedron with holes. And not only does it have holes, we can also not when we iterate over this to compute code, we cannot touch the holes. If we touch the holes, we, we blow up the complexity of our algorithm. So we have to only iterate over the non-zeros and not the holes. In addition, as I showed you, uh, the tensor data structure creates a dependency through my iteration space, so through my loops. And, and C creates a dependency as well. And when I want to merge these two spaces to do the product, I merge, uh, we think of merging spaces, and then I merge the iteration graphs. So now we have an iteration graph where two arrows come into the same index variable. And at that point, I have to uh, iterate over the intersection because of the multiplication there. And then I add in the dependency, the chain for A, which is the result, but this A does not impact the merging. So this is one iteration graph, and we can create iterate or our compiler automatically creates iteration graph for any expression. These are some examples from tensor algebra, linear algebra, and block linear algebra. And these iteration graphs give us the ability to break up the complexity of our code generation into generating code level by level for one index variable at a time. So this makes it feasible to generate code for any complex expression. So the, the code we generate may be complex, but our code generation simplifies the process. So let me show you. So we are back to our tensor vector multiplication example. I'm going to suppose that the first dimension of B is dense. So I emit, or our compiler emits a dense loop. If the second dimension of B is sparse, our compiler emits a sparse loop that iterates over the format in that dimension. If B, the third dimension of B and the vector C are both sparse, our compiler emits this sparse loop that iterates over the intersection of these two, uh, two things. And then finally, it emits a compute statement in the middle. So the key here is this intersection code. That's a uh, complexity we have to deal with. Uh, and there, we, 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 we introduce our merge lattices. So uh, I'm, I simplified the expression a little bit to an element-wise multiplication of two vectors. It shows the same thing as the previous slide, but it ignores the fact that there's several levels uh, to it. But that's handled automatically. Uh, 
So for this element of multiplication, since the vectors are sparse, I squash them together. And since they're sparse, I have to store the indices explicitly. And then we want to iterate over the intersection of this expression. So we formalize this as a merge lattice. And this is a uh, merge lattice is an ordered lattice. And this is one point in that lattice. And this point is saying two things. It's saying iterate over B and C until either uh, while both of them have values left. And it's also saying at each point in that iteration, compute a value if both B and C has a value at that point. And then when either of them run out of value, we drop down the lattice to bottom and we're done iterating all these vectors. So we can generate code lattice point by lattice point. So this lattice only has one uh, lattice point, so we generate one loop for that lattice point. And this loops iterate while both of them have values. And then uh, since uh, we also have to uh, generate a case saying if both have a value, produce a value in the output. So let's see how that works. So here it uh, starts at both B and C. It computes them in, it figures out whether both have value. They do at this point. Then you advance B, you advance C. And then you keep going. This process keeps iterating until C now runs out of values. And now this loop will fail. And you drop to the bottom of the lattice and you're done. So the code is done executing. So that's the, uh, that's the intersection case. Now we're going to look at the addition case. And then we're going to look at how to generalize this to any expression with any number of iterators where you merge the whole thing together. So for the, uh, for the addition case, you, you want to compute the union. So you compress the two vectors. They're sparse. You want to iterate over the union, so you don't compute it, you iterate over it. Uh, we can think of it as a lattice point that iterates while either B or C has a value left. But this, uh, this turns out to be to turn into very expensive code to emit, so we rewrite it to this expression, which uh, is a sequence of uh, a disjunction of conjunctions. And then we put that into a lattice structure. And then, uh, then our compiler will emit code for this. So we can do that lattice point by lattice point. So we, fir we first emit code that iterates while both have a value left. That looks very much like in the previous slide. That iterates until C is out of values. And then we also emit uh, code or compile emit code uh, for B and C uh, for adding in the rest of B and C. So that's B and this is C. And that, that second loop will iterate until B is out of values and store them into the result. And then we also have to emit cases. And we can do that lattice point by lattice point as well. So for each loop, we emit one case per lattice point dominated by that lattice point. So we emit one for B and C, one for just B, and one for C. And that gives us our whole code. So that was the two binary cases. So let's look at some examples quickly for compound cases where you merge arbitrary many things. So this is B plus C times D. The lattice is more complicated, but uh, our compiler just emits code lattice point by lattice point. Here you're adding three vectors together. So there's a lot of lattice point, but the code generation can just emit code lattice point by lattice point. So suppose we want to make D dense. Now you can simplify the merge lattices. And by simplifying them, you simplify the code. So uh, because when D is dense, when you're done iterating or D, you're done iterating altogether. So the loops simplify. And we, uh, in our paper, we described how to generate lattices for an expression and how to optimize them as well. So that's it for describing our uh, compiler. And now I'm going to evaluate. So the story of our evaluation is that there's an infinite space of expressions. Some of these expressions have been hand optimized by expert programmers, and many of them have not. Most of them have not. For the expressions that someone hand optimized, we perform comparably if it's sparse expressions. For the other expressions, we have the same good performance. We have great performance across the board. So let's look at the expression people have spent maybe the most time hand optimizing, sparse matrix vector multiply. So for this expression, so these results show uh, uh, results for matrices in the uh, Florida sparse matrix collection. It's normalized to the time taken by TACO, and TACO is our approach. So as you can see, we are comparable performance. Sometimes we are a little faster, sometimes we are a little slower. But it's about the same. We also emit parallel code, and Intel MKL also supports parallel execution. But again, we're about the same performance. Let's look at a more compound example, and this is a very interesting expression. This is called sample dense dense matrix multiplication, and it's taken from machine learning, the machine learning literature. In this expression, you multiply a dense matrix by a dense matrix. So if you were to do this as a binary expression, you would have to compute 64 inner products in this example. However, you then multiply that multiplication by a sparse matrix. 
And if you want to compute this value of the result, then you have to do this pro dot product. But for the entries that have, no, uh, that have zeros in the sparse matrix, you don't have to compute any dot products. So if you compute this as binary expressions, first one and then the other, you're doing way too much work that you then throw away. But if you do it as one kernel, you can cut down from 64 in the products to just 10 in the products. So you go way faster. And that's what these results show. Taco emits code that does this whole thing in one kernel. Uh, Eigen has implemented the same code, but Ublas does not do it in a single kernel. And that means that their performance suffer. And the sparser the matrix become, the more they suffer. So they have an asymptotic uh, uh, drawback. MTTKRP is an expression taken from um, uh, data analytics. And in MTTKRP, you're multiplying a tensor, a tree tensor, by two matrices in different dimensions. And you have to implement this expression in one kernel for performance. Uh, and that's what uh, Taco emits. And that's what Splat, which is hand-optimized code, implemented. Uh, Mat the MATLAB tensor toolbox does not do it in a single kernel, so their performance suffers. So those are our results. Uh, and we have implemented uh, Taco both as a C++ library and as an online code generator tool. If you download and use the C++ library, you define, you define formats, then you load tensors, you read tensors, then you define your computation, and then you simply compute with that. With the online code generator tool, you can just go online at that URL, and you can type in any expression, and you can use these drop boxes to decide what the format should be. You can drag them around each other to create column-oriented formats, and then it will generate code for you. All of this is available at online under the MIT license uh, without uh, any restriction other attribution. So in summary, we have created the first compiler theory that can generate code for both dense and sparse tensor algebra kernels. And this is important because uh, just uh, writing a library that, has the, uh, that contains the binary expressions and then composing them together uh, causes you to lose a lot of performance, sometimes orders of magnitude for sparse computations. Uh, you lose performance in three ways. The first is that you lose temporal locality because you uh, write the first result from the first kernel all the way into memory before you go back and read the first component, and now it's flushed out of your cache. The second way you can lose performance is that the second kernel sometimes throws away work that the first kernel did. And if you don't, uh, if you don't take that into account, you're doing too much work. And the third way is that the second kernel sometimes requires a different format, different layout of your data than the first kernel. And uh, then you have to reorganize data, which can cost you a lot. And the solution to these problems is to develop a compiler that shapes the code to the data so, and that compiles whole expressions at once. And this means that the composition in these programs happen in the, in the code and not by passing data structures between uh, different kernels. Thank you. <laughs>